Thank you. All right. Um, thank you all for joining us at this, the first in a series of events which will lead us gently to the Shelley Bicentennial Conference in 2022 at Keats House, Hampstead, when we will hopefully have grown used once again to conversing in the same room, wine in hand, fighting over the final canopy. I would like to thank the co-organisers of this conference, Amanda Blake Davis, Anna Mercer and Paul Stevens, who are here with us and who made tonight possible. But whilst the far and away, Zoom has allowed for two of our speakers and many members of our audience to join us from outside of the UK, so welcome. Okay, I will say a few words of introduction. Uh, the panel will discuss the poem for about 40 minutes and I, I want them to lead, I want them to steer. We'll use some of my questions as a starting point, but we will follow their wisdom and see where we end up. Then it's over to you for questions. And the questions, straightforward, I want them to be put, put them into the, the chat box, then they'll be sent to me, none of the stupid raising of hand thing or any of that. We'll just keep it simple, straight into the box. Um, and on to Epipsychudion, published anonymously 200 years ago, early in 1821, though no one seems to know exactly when. It's one of those romantic poems with troublesome titles. Thalaba, Gabir, the Jawa, over the pronunciation of which many a friendship, of course, has faltered, if not entirely failed. You'll probably hear at least two pronunciations tonight. It is a poem that beguiles as much as it frustrates. For some, it takes a while to love, Whereas for me, it is Shelley's masterpiece. We are very fortunate tonight to be joined by four experts. I'm going to introduce them now. So we've got Dr. Will Bowers, lecturer in 18th century literature and thought at Queen Mary University of London. His wonderful monograph, The Italian Idea, was published in 2020 by Cambridge University Press. He is an editor on the final volume of Longman Annotated Poems of Shelley, expected in 2022, and editor of a new edition of Shelley's Letters, which will come forth with OUP soon. Mm. Professor Stuart Curran is the Vartan Gregorian Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania. He is associate editor of the Johns Hopkins Complete Poetry of Percy Bysshe Shelley, and the general editor of the works of Charlotte Smith of Chatterone and Pickering. He is known to everyone here as the author of two indispensable landmark studies of Shelley, Shelley's Cenci, Scorpions Ringed with Fire, and Shelley's uh, Annus Mirabilis. <laughs> professor Michael Rossington is Professor of Romantic Literature in Newcastle University. He is the editor of Longman Annotated English Poets, the Poems of, Ed of Shelley. His splendid and authoritative edition of Epipsychudion is in volume four and came out in 2014. Finally, Dr. Valentina Varinelli is adjunct professor of English at the Catholic University of Milan. Her doctoral thesis was on Percy Bysshe's verse and prose writings in Italian. There we go, I got a sort of serenade then, that was fantastic. She was assistant editor and co-translator of the two volume parallel text Italian edition of Percy Bysshe's complete works, Mondadori, 2018. She will, among other things, be talking to us about some of the groundbreaking archival work she's been doing on Emilia Viviani, the Emily of Shelley's poem. So if we could do a sort of, I don't know, just a gestural welcome to these wonderful people. And um, I'll begin with just the first question, as I say, lay hands on it, panel, do what you want. So first question for Stuart. I'd like to begin with you, if I may. Shelley called Epipsychudion an idealized history of my life and feelings. You, I know, don't regard it as very interesting to look at through the lens of Shelleyan autobiography. What then would you say is the subject of the poem? What is it most about? Um, I actually think it is most, uh, mostly about Shelley's trying to come to terms with his um, uh, series of infatuations of young women. Um, uh, I, this would be the second in, in one year, almost, Sophia Stacy in Florence and uh, Teresa uh, uh, Viviani in Pisa. And um, uh, I, I think it is a self-justification in that sense um, that he is not 
basically um, in love with every young woman he finds, but he is in love with the idea of love. Um, and well, at least that's what the poem is about. Um, uh, what I find also interesting about it is what is outside of the autobiography, um, by which I mean the last 200 lines um, and, uh, um, and the kind of ravishing uh, descriptive power of them, which, which in its detail stands completely against the metaphorization, the distancing by metaphor um, that uh, most of the rest of the poem um, unfolds around. Is that enough to begin with? Fantastic, absolutely. Um, I was just wondering if you could perhaps tell me a, a little bit about how you think the anonymity of the poem matters. Um, also, the advertisement and those sort of introductory verses, how does that condition a reader's response, do you think? Well, the curious thing is, is that the only identification in the poem of the author is S after the advertisement. Um, um, but if that S is Shelley, then what he is doing is differentiating himself from the, the author of the poem itself. And, the, um, and then the prelude also differentiates itself from the author of the poem because it is, um, it is about its verses. Um, um, it is as if the poem itself is speaking. Um, and then the envoy, um, also distances us from whoever that author of the poem is, who is dead, um, um, by calling back um, um, uh, the various figures um, 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 from the real autobiography, that is to say, Mary and Jane Williams and whoever Primus is. Um, Primus could be Shelley, for that matter, um, rather than um, um, Edward Williams. Um, uh, uh, all of this, um, uh, 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 I haven't got my hands completely around um, what death is doing in the poem, um, but it is ubiquitous. Um, and the sense, I think, um, 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 that um, every poem is a recreation and a death leading to another poem, which is a recreation and a death. And that goes also for these women uh, with whom he is infatuated. Um, um, uh, he is always seeking something beyond them. Um, and he's coming to terms with that in the sense that this is a basic part of the creative process. Um, 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 my sense is that the poem is really about creativity. Uh, and, um, and I put it right next to um, uh, the major work that will follow it, which is um, the defense of poetry. Wonderful. Thank you, Stuart. That's absolutely wonderful. Can, can, can I ask if any of the panel would like to pick up on what, what Stuart said so far? Possibly, sadly, for the, the sake of uh, argument, I, I completely agree with uh, uh, Stuart's... Um, <laughs> it's not like Stuart's offering a non-biographical reading of the poem, but that it uh, to not prioritise the biographical reading of the poem seems to me to be absolutely the way forward an infatuation with young women but also an infatuation with women who weren't particularly young um the sensitive plant or uh, to maria gisborne and things like that and an infatuation with a with, an, with another and the the multiple possibilities that that other can bring um and that's when the, the two sections that i uh tend to go to most in the poem that, that polemical section in the the late 100s, um, which is written in a quite loose couplet, uh, and then those very tight uh, descriptive lines, uh, 380 and onwards, uh, Emily, uh, with the address to Emily and the ship and the journey to the island. I think when the poem is at its least metaphorical and its least uh, kind of courtly, it's at its, it's, at its best. Wonderful. Um, Michael, Valentina? I certainly, um, well, I think all that Stuart said is, is absolutely spot on. It's difficult to, um, to, to disagree with anything. I think, I think the, 
the last thing that Stuart said about the proximity of um, epipsychic into a defense of poetry has to be right. Just thinking about composition dates. Um, so he writes a letter, doesn't he, in closing Epipsychidion to, uh, to Charles Ollier in, in the middle of February uh, 1821. And, and that's the time when he's, he's, he's drafting, you know, the drafting of defense is, has either started by, by then or it's, it's about to start. And then I was just going to add maybe Adonais as well, to some extent, is part of this. Yeah. Uh, part, part of this group of, of works which seem very much to be speaking to that idea of the um, of poetry uh, uh, so yeah thank you do you think it sort of um, fits into that perfect category of you know what the late Michael O'Neill would describe as you know self-conscious poetry is he is it working through its own heritage its own indebtedness as well as breaking new ground. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that's right, Bish. I think that that's a really uh, important point, your word indebtedness, um, and, and that sense of um, perhaps also it's, it's uh, just touching on the advertisement and the, the, the kind of, self-awareness within the poem um, and, and thinking about it in relation to earlier Shelley writings as well. I mean, that, that, that sense that perhaps he is kind of drawing in um, earlier work and, and earlier influences. Uh, I mean, given the fact, I suppose, what I'm referring to here is the fact that I think one can think of Epipsychidion in a way um, as part of quite a long continuum, mm. and you could you could reach back, for example, to the summer of eighteen eighteen, to the translation of the symposium, certainly, uh, and and you could also um, obviously think about the uh, Prometheus Unbound and and the um, Asia's lyric uh, about about love in 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 that poem. Um, so I kind of. And, and I think you you can also bring in other things like his interest in improvisation at, at this time, uh, December, January, December, 1820, January, 1821, he's seeing uh, Screechy. Um, uh, I think it was Richard Holmes actually, who um, says that Epipsychidion is a conscious piece of rhetorical improvisation. Uh, you know, partly influenced by Screechy, and I think I think that's in the mix as well. It, it, it's a kind of yeah. I, I don't only if it's only a conscious piece of improvisation if you know what Screechy's performances were like, if you know how kind of formally <laughs> and rhetorically and metaphorically filled they were. I think too often we think of imp these improvisers as improvising, which obviously they were, but there's something incredibly formal about the improvising that. Uh, Screechy does and the kind of classical topics and the classical conversations that, that he goes into. And the difference between a really drunken evening at the comedy workshop and uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, right? <laughs> like, um, could, Valentina, do you have anything to add? Well, the only thing that I would add at this point, um, Michael went back to 1818 and Prometheus Unbound. I would go back even further uh, to is that 1815 or perhaps even earlier when Shelley first encountered, uh, we haven't mentioned Dante yet, but back in 1814-15, Shelley translated uh, this uh, very famous sonnet, uh, Dante, uh, from Dante addressed to his friend Guido Cavalcanti, which is um, an important uh, source of inspiration. Uh, and even more than that, it's a model in a sense for or the third section of the poem, the one containing the Invitation au Voyage, and also for the congedo, the closing stanza, with that um, a reference to her circle of friends in real life. And to me, it's, I mean, I'm not particularly for a biographical reading of the poem. I'm very suspicious of that, but um, certainly the 
biographical, the historical biographical context is uh, extremely important to understand that poem um, and just uh, to think of this particular sonnet and why was Shelley still thinking about this sonnet from Dante uh, at that point, so many years after he had translated it and published his translation. And I think um, it may have something to do with um, the situation situation in which he was in Pisa. I mean, uh, it was now almost three years since he had moved to Italy. And for the first time, he and, and his wife had stopped traveling all around the place and had settled down in Pisa. And I think uh, in that first season winter, 1820-1821, he uh, hoped for the first time that he could uh, sort of realize this ideal of um, community of uh, selected friends, of chosen friends with which to live um, in uh, seclusion, separate from the cares of the world. And, and at the time in Pisa, he really had um, a social life, which he hadn't had um, since Marlowe, basically. So I think um, that's what we find in, um, in the final section of the poem. Perhaps that's uh, what contributes to it being so um, factual and so different from the uh, rhapsodic previous sec section. Wonderful, wonderful. Please, Stuart, please. Um, I'd like to go back to that issue of biography quickly. Um, um, I think the problem with it is, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, um, that, that already the poem has distanced Amelia from herself um, multiple times. Um, uh, those uh, 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 before we get down to calling her a metaphor, she has been apostrophized twenty-eight times in different with with different metaphors, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, if one takes that as not uh, improvisation but the deliberate creation of a very subtle writer, um, what he is doing is is uh, is bringing to the fore that. Um, that this poem is not about people so much as principles or um, needs, or, or, I mean, we could use kind of Freudian language, um, uh, uh, which he doesn't have, of course. Um, so that by the time you get to the moon and the sun and the comet, um, uh, and the comet transforms into Venus, um, well then it seems to me that, that uh, uh, narrowing it down to actual human beings, flesh and blood, um, changes the entire course of the poem. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's my point about that. I, I don't suppose it needs to be hammered any further. It's, it's wonderful. Eh? It's, it's this, this idea of, as you say, prosopopeias normally, or, uh, or apostrophe is normally used as a way of a, you know, summoning someone into an empty space. But actually the technique here is, pushing farther and farther away. A wonderful, wonderful um, idea. Could I move on to a, another question now? I I'd like to ask Will now um, a question about the poem. Now, we know your, you know, your favorite sections, you've talk talked about, you know, you highlighted some of them already. And I'm just interested in the fact that the poem introduces us to an Italian setting and your work has been focused of late on the Italian idea. And I was wondering what you would, what you would make of the Italian setting of a Pipsicudian. Does it matter? Um, well, it certainly matters. Uh, the, 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 the poem is not, uh, I don't give a reading of the poem in my, in my book called The Italian Idea. And I, indeed, I, I searched the, the PDF today. And I don't even mention the word, uh, <laughs> uh, which <laughs> tells you something about uh, um, where it stands um, but going uh, the, the reason it didn't in earlier versions when it was a dissertation uh, an undergraduate dissertation actually um, it, it did have a, a reading of Episcopalian but I found it too hard to square circles about Dante and the Vita Nova and um, somebody who was writing in a okay a, a slightly platonic world thanks to Aquinas but somebody was who was writing in a world with a clear moral center and who had a clear moral center uh, and, and Shelley who was writing a poem that tries to instantiate a, a different a moral center without any of those comforts um, but going back to the poem I, I certainly think that this 
we, we can talk about the Italian setting. Um, you know, there's that bit about the, the sweet scent of lemons, um, which is obviously that kind of Goethe, um, the land where lemons grow thing. And there's um, this all kind of Mediterraneanizing of, of the of the island in which they go to, which is not necessarily Italian, but it is part of that uh, cult of the South, um, as Marilyn Butler would have it. But I, I think there's something uh, so I've talked about as this idea is this kind of idea of only for British writers. I'm not saying Italian writers felt some kind of great freedom in Italy after the Napoleonic the Wars, um, but that idea that uh, so that those lines narrow the heart that loves, the brain that contemplates, the life that wears, the spirit that creates one object and one form and builds thereby a sepulchre for its eternity. That idea of kind of fecundity, mm. that idea of kind of multiplicity, um, that uh, Italian scenes um, gives it gives particularly in Eugenian Hills. Um, which is kind of for me the a, a big poem behind this poem, particularly the sections that I enjoy the most of the poem are um, if you can Hills is about finding that isle in the sea of misery, then the island that they go to could well be one of those uh, mm -hmm. islands. Um, but also in in the sections that, that Stuart has praised at the end of the poem, uh, we're starting to get into triumph territory as well, um, particularly Rousseau's vision. Um, the, the visioned wanderings and the meeting with the woman. Um, so uh, I think it is important that, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a poem that uh, relies on a certain type of uh, Mediterranean-ness, but it also rubs against that. Quite regular heroic couplets uh, in places, nothing like Rimini, nothing like Endymion in parts, but in parts has those kind of irregular couplets. So um, it, it didn't sit easily, why it wasn't part of the study, but it, going back to it, I think it's a kind of staging post between those descript local descriptive poems uh, like Huguenot Hills and that kind of visionary rhyme, that kind of massive impetus on creativity that you get in The Witch or in The Triumph. Well, wonderful. I, I think that's what it is that, that sort of pain, isn't it, with the, the, the profound Englishness of the poem at certain points. And then these, these, these as you say, the loco descriptive. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else want to pick up on, on, on that, that question? Push it forward. Valentina needs to tell us more about the Vita Nova than I know. <laughs> I mean, you. I mean, you both uh, spoke of the Englishness of the poem, and and I, I agree with you on that. I mean, the rhyme couplets and all that. At the same point, I think uh, it has a certain Italian flavor. I wouldn't know how better to define it, but it's it's there. Um, perhaps Italian readers feel it more than English readers, I don't know. Uh, I certainly feel that there are passages, phrases and expressions that are lifted from uh, Dante, from all of his works, as well as from the works of his contemporaries, his friends, Cavalcanti, Donati, lesser known uh, early Italian authors. And going back before Dante, Brunetto Latini, I think um, Timothy Webb first uh, identified a distinct echo almost a translation from um, um, a work by Brunetto Latini, who's master uh, Dante's teacher and character in the Inferno, um, who, um, whose work then uh, Shelley also translated in, in part. So um, yes, it's, it's almost an in-between poem. Uh, it's, it's very, very English, and at the same time, it's very Italian. Uh, the whole structure as well, the combination of verse and the prose advertisement with um, both explicit and implicit allusions to, to Dante and the Vita Nuova. Clearly, Shelley has the Vita Nuova very much in mind. And, and the whole um, work that Dante uh, carries across from the Vita Nuova to um, the Divine Comedy, his uh, celebration of Beatrice that uh, progressively um, becomes less and less uh, a real woman, less and less flesh and blood, to use Shelley's own words. He's he's trying to do the same thing, I I believe, with uh, the character of Emily. Uh, that wonderfully links to what Stuart said earlier with the the apostrophe, the, you know, the apostrophe and the apostrophization of, you know, the, uh, that's I, I like that very much. Uh, Michael, do you do you have anything to add? I was just thinking uh, as you were speaking, Valentina, about the translation of the first uh, canzone of the Convivio, um, which uh, is obviously um, 
you know that that's that's in a sense um, within epi, epi, epipsychidian or, or a dimension of that uh, translation is 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 kind of repeated in epipsychidian, um, and so this is uh, this survives in 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 manuscript form um, and seems to be probably again in terms of composition difficult to date exactly um but but certainly it's it's one of a series of i suppose it, it, italian writings or italian inflected writings that that pre precede epipsychidian and the other one i was just going to mention very briefly was fiordispina mm. um which is um by most accounts abandoned uh in late January 21 and taken over as it were by um by epipsychidian and I think that I did some kind of crazy rough calculation of the number of lines <laughs> of your Spina that are drawn upon in in epipsychidian and um you know the proportion of epipsychidian that is if you like kind of reworked out of your Spina and it I mean it's we're not talking a huge amount. 20% of Fjord Espina is drawn upon an epipsychidian, and those, um, uh, and and that constitutes about uh, uh, a tenth of, of um, epipsychidian. Um, but I but I'm interested in again that sense of I think something that that many readers notice uh, about epipsychidian. <clears throat> excuse me, is that sense of pace, you know, rapidity uh, of composition, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, and just that um, in a way, if one is trying to map uh, the, the kind of order of these various works, it's, it's as if somehow he's, he's kind of reaching back to you know the the translation from from um the, the canzone and fiordespina and and kind of immediately reworking them repurposing them um well I, I, this oh, please stuart i only wanted to, to take that in a slightly different direction which is to say that dante's Be beatrice changes uh her nature, depending on the poem um, and her place in it, that is to say, from uh, Vita Nuova uh, to the Paradiso. Um, and there's a curious way in which um, uh, Emily, not Teresa, um, uh, is obviously the heroine of the Knight's Tale or, or the Teseida. Mm -hmm. um, and then she becomes, or maybe she is, first of all, Fiordespina. That is to say, the lines are taken straight out of the poem uh, and moved into Episcopalian. Um, I don't believe we get to Emily until, as a name, until fairly late in the poem uh, when she, uh, she's uh, asked to accompany him on his trip, so to speak. So that that uh, um, I, that's almost deliberate. Um, 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 one model after another, um, and of course, Beatrice. Uh, stands in the background of the poem uh, constantly and is at times alluded to in it. Um, so um, uh, 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 the figure keeps keeps changing its dimensions in order to gain, I, I don't know, new kind of mythological ground or uh, uh, context. Um, 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 other poems, other people uh, with the same kind of obsession with the, if you will, avish weiblicke. Um, so anyway, that's 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 my sense of how Fiordespina moves into the poem. Well, this this works really nicely actually because I, I I'd like to ask Valentina um, about some of your recent research um, because Emily, Teresa, they they're sort of hovering over you know us like a Shelleyan cloud, and I think we might need to puncture it. So I'd like to ask you know um, Shelley was later to say that he could not bear to look at the Pipsicudion because the person it celebrates had proven to be a cloud instead of a Juno 
see what I did there with my metaphor. See, I was ahead of it. Um, could you enlighten us on your recent research into Teresa Viviani's correspondence and her relationship or not with Emilia or Emily? Yeah, well, with, with pleasure. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd rather call her Teresa Viviani throughout, mm. and that's uh, basically because that's, that's, what, that's her name. Uh, she was baptized with Teresa and a number of middle names, none of which is Emilia. Emilia is a nickname. Uh, it's not a nickname that Shelley came up with for her. Um, this is a um, common misconception that we have sort of inherited from early commentators. I think it was Teresa's biographer, who was also a descendant of her family, who first suggested that uh, Shelley, um, after meeting Teresa, um, decided to nickname her Emilia, thinking of uh, Boccaccio's Teseida delle Nostre d'Emilia, which uh, uh, Stuart has uh, just mentioned, and which of course is uh, the model for uh, the night sale. Um, and he would have done that according to this commentator because uh, of the similar situation in which uh, Teresa found herself that was similar to um, the situation in which we find the female protagonist of Boccaccio's epic. Uh, she was being sought after by the suitors and uh, there were these two friends in, in, in the Teseida who um, fight to death to decide who will marry Emilia. Uh, but um, well, first of all, there were no two suitors when the Shelleys were first introduced to Teresa Viviani and they start addressing her as Emilia straight away from the very beginning. We can also see that in, in Mary Shelley's and Claire Claremont's journals of the period, they call her Emilia. Uh, but back then, uh, as far as they, know, they knew, there was only one suitor who wasn't even really a suitor. It was just the man whom his family had decided would marry her. Uh, it was obviously a combined marriage. Um, the second suitor uh, enters the stage only relatively late around April and uh, Shelley meets him. Teresa doesn't seem to be particularly interested in, in him and, um, and the second suitor again appears when the poem is finished and published. Uh, but the thing is, uh, yeah, I found this letter uh, from Teresa Viviani to Francesco Pacchiani, who is the, the man who introduced uh, Claire Clermont and then the Shelleys to Teresa, uh, in which she finds herself Teresa Emilia Viviani. And this letter predates uh, her encounter with any of the Shelley household. So she, she already had this nickname. Mm. I still don't know where that comes from, whether it may still have some something to do with um, Boccaccio's Teresa delle Nostre d'Emilia or not. Uh, it may be that Pacchiani came up with this nickname for her. Uh, it may be totally unrelated. I have no idea. If anyone has any suggestions, please let me know because I've been trying to, to figure it out for years now. Uh, but this does not mean that Shelley did not seize the opportunities that this sobriquet offered in terms of you know, intertextuality and literary echoes. And so he, uh, we know that he associated Teresa with the character from Boccaccio's epic because, um, well, we don't really know if he ever read, um, as far as I know, there is no evidence that he read the Teseida, but it's not in his reading list or anything. But uh, we have his a translation into Italian of a few lines from Chaucer's The Night Sale. And in these lines, uh, Emily, the name Emily appears and Emily is compared for her beauty to a white lily. And she, and he may have meant this uh, uh, translation. He obviously translated the lines into Italian for, for Teresa. He may have meant them as a homage. Perhaps he intended to include these lines in a letter to her, uh, the, the draft of this translation occurs in a, in a working notebook, which also contains a number of what look like um, fragmentary drafts or letters to Teresa Viviani. Uh, there may be other um, 
other figures, other literary figures that Shelley had in mind when associating Teresa, when, when calling Teresa Emilia, when using this name for his character, his female character in a Kidden, there's this coincidence that uh, strikes me and that may be relevant to a Kidden. Uh, I don't really know what to do with it. I'll throw it at you. Anyway, um, the Emilia is also the name of the woman who is um, celebrated in Milton's love, love poems in Italian. Milton is the one major precursor of Shelley in terms of a, a British writer who writes poetry in Italian, as Shelley tried to do with little success uh, at some point uh, around <laughs> that time in Pisa. <laughs> Very little. Unless, unless there's more and we, and we haven't, it hasn't come I like that. That's <laughs> <good. laughs> who knows? Who, Right, who knows? But um, I mean, in, in Shelley certainly knew Milton's poems in Italian. There are, I think, five sonnets and the stanza of a canzone. There are, um, I mean, Milton scholars consider them as a belated manifestation of uh, European uh, Renaissance patriarchy. Uh, Milton basically felt that he had to write love poetry. It's the only instance in Milton's work of love poetry, and he felt he had to write it in Italian because love poetry was the domain of the Italians, was the domain of Petrarch. And, and what's interesting in relation to Epipsychidion is that um, these poems are not really about a woman. Uh, there probably never was a uh, Italian woman, let alone an Italian woman named Emilia in Milton's life. Um, this woman represents love poetry and love more in general. So it's an allegory just like the, the figure of uh, um, Emily in Epipsychidion. And there's um, um, these poems are a, metapo a metapoetic reflection in which Milton basically uh, experiments with this with this form, with this poetic form, only to overcome it. It's the same thing as he did with Lycidas. He, he wrote uh, a pastoral elegy just to be able to overcome this genre and move to higher poetic forms, you know, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. That the same thing happens with this small canzoniere in Italian. And it's interesting that there's a, a meta poetic reflection here, just as there is one in Epipsychidion. I don't know if, I mean, Shelley certainly knew these sonnets because they, they were published in Milton's first collection of poems uh, just before Lisbeth and Comus. He must have seen them. And, and, where, I don't know, and where, he can, may, where can everybody read your research? Where can we, where can we find this article? I, I haven't really mentioned this anywhere. Oh, okay, <laughs> they're, they're lucky, they're lucky. <laughs> I mean, I just, because they don't really know what to do with it. I mean, yeah, okay, and then um, it, uh, it's just a Strange coincidence, if it is one. Maybe so we, so we've got this, we, trying to imitate Milton. I don't know. Well, you 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 you've you've introduced something that's absolutely wonderful because we've gone from possibility of improvisation, absolutely uh, considered figuration, um, Englishness, profound uh, Italian qualities. It is a, an absolutely glorious bridge, to use a Cranian metaphor, perhaps, between the what we you know early Shelley and what's to come. Um, I'm going to end because I, I'm st I'm stealing you from from our you know our, our, our audience who are desperate to ask questions. And um, Michael, you did a, a, a you were you were elegant because the question I was going to ask you about editing, you 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 already answered beautifully. So it's all done. It's all done. But my my final question is going to be this. Um, I I think that a Pipsicudion is a masterpiece. I I adore it. Um, I want to kind of get your bandstand ranking of it. What do you how do you think it balances with the rest of Shelley's oeuvre? Where does it stand to you guys, for you guys? Anyone who wants to begin. Uh, can I just ask a quick question about editing before we, we mm. just to just just to Stuart? Just to, uh, if we, we seem to all agree about the biographical 
problem or lack thereof, as in the, 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 the you know, from Cameron, but also back Thornton Hunt, a long tradition of people saying this is about this and that's about that. When you come to uh, edit the poem uh, and uh, write a commentary on it, like Longman House or anything like that, how, how much space do you give to uh, th things that you don't believe to be right or proper? I, I had this same problem with the triumph. You know, I, I don't buy the Demanian view about the sun and sheer imposition, all that stuff. I do not think the sun is a uh, is, is what he says it is. But uh, it's hard when it's the most influential view about the poem for 30 years to not write a commentary on it. I just wondered if you had well, thought. You, you raised the, um, as I've been preparing for this conversation, um, I was thinking to myself, boy, I hope I don't get assigned this poem. <laughs> because, uh, it, because it does, and I was thinking also of Michael uh, having having to be fair to everybody. Um, and and the, the, the footnotes, because the poem is so densely learned, um, require um, uh, most of the page. Um, um, uh, uh, I don't know how to answer that question um, because because uh, uh, once you put in what everybody has thought or uh, all the different assignments uh, of, of biographical integers into the poem that people have come up with, you have established that for better or for worse as how it's going to be read. You, um, you can even say that the people have doubted this, but nonetheless, um, you're reifying it. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and yet you can't possibly not mention it. Um, uh, I, um, uh, uh, Michael, if I could uh, 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 put this in a different way, um, I felt the same way in, um, in editing the Trenchy um, and I deliberately did not do what you did. Um, um, I gave a reference to where all of the Shakespearean allusions could be found, if they are Shakespearean allusions, because I felt that if I kept putting them into the poem, the poem looked like a pastiche rather than um, the original work that it is. Um, so anyway, Will, you raise the essential question and I don't think there's an answer. Well, I, I think well, this is a perfect place to end, I think. So what, what we'll do is let's have a, say, two, three minute recess where we can stand up, charge their glasses and whatnot. Then I'm going to get a whole load of questions to then throw back at you guys and, and hear your wisdom. So should we do that? Should we say uh, three minutes? Let's do that.
Oh, to all of you who've sent wonderful questions to me already, can I just, um, just, just this, this is perfect. You've got two minutes to do it. Can you send them to Amanda? Um, Amanda's going to send them to me. So just, just rather than um, direct, because then I've got like four different streams to look at, if that's okay. So copy and paste it back. So to start then, um, let's begin with a question from Robert Scott to all the panelists. I was wondering if the panelists could comment on the poem's self-professed status as weak verse. Why might verse be weak? Why this poem in particular? Is there a productivity or capacity to this weakness, alien to stronger art forms? Shelley's snide reference to high verse painting and sculpture at the end of Alaster comes to mind. So whoever wants to begin with that. Um, well, what do you think he means by weak then? Is it, is it that thing that he's worried about at the start um, and then subsequently becomes worried about after the poem is published? Um, that, that he's aware that the audience for the poem may be um, small and platonic. Um, uh, that, that it's not strong verse in the sense that uh, though it takes a heroic metre, um, it is kind of, uh, well, Mike Daniel says something like that the poem never never settles at one point, that it constantly re-metaphors or re-symbolises and that it, it, it would be a kind of strong poem that would decide on a form and st stay with it, whereas this poem constantly, I think actually a question says this, John says, seeing it compartmentalised terms, well, compartmentalised terms might be generous, it, it seems to kind of move, and there'd be these kind of obvious breaks and movements, I, I think that might be seen as weak, not formally coherent, uh, but intentionally not formally coherent, pleasantly so, pleasantly multi multiplying, pleasantly kind of uh, fecund, I, I suppose. I, I, I want to say something briefly, just which is I, I, I'm thinking of all of the intertextual comments that have been made and everything, and you know, and, and the fact that we all differ on the 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 pronunciation sometimes of the title and whatnot. I always think about that preposition, you know, epi, which is on app in for. I mean, it's, it's a it's a messy preposition, and if we think about a weakness in anything, it's in connections, and so. I've always, I'm just thinking of all the various connections we've been describing, improvisation, apostrophe, Englishness, the Italianate. A poem I perhaps is going to be weak <laughs> if you've got such diversity and variety. Um, possibly, I don't know. But anybody else want to add um, anything else to add to that? Stuart, I see. Uh, uh, yeah, um, it's... it's uh... Partly, partly, it's the the deep truth is imageless again, and uh, and um, and uh, this poet and no poet actually can ever define it. Um, but I think also the 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 amount of uh, uh, language um, uh, right from the beginning, the uh, the withered wreath, um, uh, or later on, very far into the poem, these uh, uh, petals pale are dead. Um, uh, it's as if just in writing, um, once, once it's written, it's gone. Um, uh, 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 part of creative, um, uh, uh, let's take it back to the old of the West Wind, because I think that's, that's the, the concept uh, uh, being, being probed here. Um, uh, you make something living by killing something else. And, uh, and even as you were writing in, in a kind of fervor and rhapsody, and certainly that's how the end of the poem builds, um, um, what's the words that, are, that have been spoken are now gone. They're dead. Um, so uh, uh, 
or I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the, in, the, uh, in the epigraph that were her words. Um, uh, uh, you create something out of itself, um, but the act of creation is also an act of losing it. Um, and, but if you stop, well, you expire. And uh, that's what the poem does. So it's a, it's a continual act of creation knowing that, <clears throat> that it can't ever reach its end <clears throat> and that, um, um, <clears throat> and that it, it, it can't, and it can't go backwards either. Is, so. is that why, is, is that why Mary, so Mary doesn't like it and most biographers have attributed that to her not liking it because of amorous contexts, but she also, as well, the fictional situation of the witch would suggest that she also doesn't like the witch. Um, and that, that thing that Shelley writes in a letter to John Gisborne, um, the episode is a mystery as to real flesh and blood. You know that I do not deal in those articles, which is bollocks, but that's by the by. You might as well go to a gin shop for a leg of mutton as expect anything human or earthly from me. Um, uh, is, is that why it's weak? Because it's not, it's about creation. It's about creativity. It's about being on things, but that, that means it doesn't have a, uh, something to, hold on to to cleave to yeah i think stuart and and will you you i think you're absolutely right but both of you and what you said there was this another letter um late sort of 18th june 1822 he's still talking about the psychidian i it doesn't he ask gisborne or, or maybe ask Gisborne to ask Olia or ask Olia for a copy of the poem as late as January 1822, suggesting he's still not seen it in print. But anyway, um, he says something similar to, th there's an aspect of what, uh, of the letter that we'll refer to just then, but also of what Stuart was saying uh, a moment ago, when he says um, to Gisborne, if you're anxious to hear what I have been, uh, this is in relation to Epipsychidae, and it will tell you something thereof. It is an idealized history of my life and feelings. I think one is always in love with something or other, going back to something Stuart said right at the beginning. The error, and I confess it is not easy for spirits cased in flesh and blood to avoid it, consists in seeking in a mortal image the likeness what it, of what is perhaps eternal. So I, I think that um, what Stuart was saying a moment ago seems to me absolutely right. There is, there is a, there's something kind of impossible that this poem is wrestling with. Um, and, and for me, possibly an answer to um, Robert's question, um, maybe that's, that's the kind of weakness that, that he's referring to. Uh, if I could add to that, <clears throat> looking forward, um, uh, from this poem, um, by the time of the triumph of life, Shelley is really questioning the whole nature of metaphor and what it does and how we operate and what it does to us. Uh, and it may be that that's what is being slowly thought about here as well, um, that, that um, as we grasp for some word to define somebody, we're over defining the person, if you see what I mean. Um, the person, the, the, the actual person isn't in the poem. Um, all there are are these definitions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the more the definitions, <clears throat> the less human, which is what the letter to uh, uh, Gisborne says. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I want to I want to add um, I've got a question here. Um, um, here comes uh, something. So this is from Matt Alinda. Nabogodi, she, she asks, you are all dissatisfied with a biographical reading, and yet we've lingered on biography. I suppose that's what we do, right? When we hate something, we talk about it the most. Could you sketch out some directions for an overtly political reading, and perhaps one that is attuned to the politics of our own time? And here I'm thinking of questions such as decolonization and critiques of nationalism, or is the poem's politics determined by escapism? Mm -hmm. 
a typical model lender to ask a really simple question. Um, uh, <laughs> the thing about talking utopia um, comes up here, I think, a bit that this is really his opportunity to talk utopia and you might see it as a kind of quintessentially post-napoleonic poem that it, it uh, by this point most things have failed um greece hasn't failed yet um but a number of uh, revolutions have failed um and that kind of weird escape to an island populated by and, and there's a kind of if you want to get into uh, talk of nationalism that that island is an intentionally national one uh they are indigenous people of the island it's very clear uh and they and they work the land and, and there's also is it in the advertisement or is it only an early draft that it's a, a saracenic fort um so there's there is a kind of a ghost of the um the political mediterranean there but I do think there's so much about escaping political commitment in, in the poem. But in terms of uh, colonization, um, uh, it's always bothered me that uh, um, the poet here has bought this island and all the people on it. Um, uh, and, uh, and he doesn't intend to disturb their way of life, but nonetheless, uh, the, 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 uh, the intrusion of capitalism into the uh, idol seems very strange um, uh, and also a, a certain kind of privilege. Um, those primitive people are very nice. They go about their, their way of life um, uh, uh, without complaint or anything like that, but there are no books or music. I've had to bring them in uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, though it's not luxurious, I've had to furnish it. So I mean, there's uh, I don't know what to, what to say. I think it is a um, a mistake. That's all. Um, I can't reconcile it with the tenor of the poem. One thing I would say is perhaps redeeming is we don't know what the books are, um, in the sense we don't know where they've come from. You know, <laughs> in the in the sense that it's not a necessarily uh, a, a Western library or whatnot. It's th th there is an unnamed quality to it. I mean, I I find this interesting because I've never thought of the poem in terms of these categories. Um, next question from uh, Maddie Callahan. I'm so sorry. I'm getting used to this chat box thingy. It's quite quite small. Um, I just wanted to thanks for some wonderful thoughts upon Epipsychodion's meaning. I thought of Sydney. I am, uh, I am not I, pity the tale of me. Is the life uh, consumable by art in Shelley's poem by some Demanian fiat? So back to you, Will. Uh, I'm wondering if those stylized couplets force us to think through the relationship between artifice or artistry itself and the stuff of reality. In this sense, should we see this as Shelley's Vita Nuova or Symposium? I'm indebted here, as ever, to Stuart's Epipsychodion, Dante, and the Renewable Life. All the best, Maddie. Any thoughts on that? Well, I guess I'll start. It is a very <laughs> artificial poem. Um, um, uh, almost as much as that has, um, uh, the next, the, the next one along, um, um, <clears throat> everything about it is from the uh, 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 from the uh, the curious um, advertisement that uh, that uh, uh, waves a flag for its learning um, to the to having a prelude and an envoy, um, uh, which takes it back to a kind of medieval um, genre, um, uh, uh, to. Uh, 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 the self-consciousness with which it demonstrates, um, 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 I don't know, it's metaphorical vocabulary. Um, everything about the poem is artificial. And yet, of course, um, it's about um, um, uh, uh, a, an erotic drive as well. So, I mean, I, I think that the, the idea of, of harmony uh, coming out of, um, of opposites, as the poem talks about it, uh, the uh, 
uh, uh, Discordia Concourse um, is built into the nature and the structure of the poem. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. No, very interesting. Thank you. I, I'll go on to the next question. Um, now, let's. Uh, um, I worked out the chat function. From now on, just send them to everyone, and I'll I'll just uh, I'll just grab them like that. Direct messages between people ends up it, it confused me terribly. So the Pipsacudion is above my head as well, as you can tell. So anyway, let's go on to the 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 next one, which I want to start with you, Valentina. Can this is from. Uh, 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 Rishkavi uh, Ragudas, apologies if I've got that trans, uh, the, the pronunciation wrong. I've already said about that with Gabir and whatnot, so don't worry. Uh, can we also see Shelley's philosophy about love as an early endorsement of what we now call polyamory? I'm thinking of a way through Dante. I don't know quite what polyamory is. No, I can I work out. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe someone, the person who asked the question, maybe. Yeah, can we get, explain. actually, yes. Can we... can we do that? What does that mean? Anybody know what polyamory means? I mean, multiple loves, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think, yeah, I think it's um, somebody who is capable uh, of, of loving multiple people at the same time the, at the same time but is important okay, it's not so somebody who uh loves somebody and yeah. then falls out of love with them then loves another person but rather you know narrow the heart that loves etc etc multiple things at multiple at the, at the same time okay so to divide is not to take away the connection to dante etc yeah, well, and, and and italian literature well that's uh i mean the source of that particular passage has been identified in Dante in the Purgatorio, where um, well Dante is obviously talking about um, the love in sense in the sense of caritas, so the love of God that unites all creatures, so all human beings, and and that determines also the um, the position of the souls in paradise and in fact the the souls that are closer to god um love more and the more they love um they do not lose anything they just gain love uh it's um and in fact those who have focused on the biographical um level of the literal level of the poem have tended to accuse shelley of you know um adapting this uh, this idea, this concept of caritas uh, for his own personal advantage, you know, sort of a self-serving um, philosophy, you know, so as to justify uh, his supposed affairs, uh, extramarital affairs. Um, I mean, if we just stick to the idea of uh, caritas or love uh, in in its highest sense. I don't know, I'm, I'm sounding Shelley, I'm I fear, but um, that's what Shelley's thinking about. He, what he's talking about in this poem is um, love, light, call it whatever you want, intellectual beauty. It's this ideal that he has. Um, it's not sensual love. I mean, it's, a, it's a, on a higher plane, in my view. and. Uh, and that's perhaps why he needs to distinguish introducing those um, cosmological images of the, the sun and the moon and the comet. Uh, if we, um, these images have been interpreted referring back to Plato, but we can also think again of Dante's distinction between different kinds of spirits in uh, the in the human. Uh, body, where well, there's um, a spirit which is uh, the spirit within um, the man's heart, which is how Dante defines it. This obviously calls to mind um, the heart of hearts and a number of other expressions. Also, the idea of the soul within my soul uh, has um, correspondence in, in what Dante says, and this is the highest spirit, which for Dante is um, love, is God, ultimately, because God is love. Uh, for Shelley, it, it, again, 
is that imagination, is that the, what he calls intellectual beauty. And then there's um, uh, the intellect, reason, and then there's the third spirit, which is the animal spirit, and that's um, love as we intend it, as we, um, especially in that, I suppose in that term, um, polyamory, hey. sensual love, love to be experienced in, uh, in, in real life, in, uh, physically, in a sense. So I'm not sure this answers your question, but I'm. I, I, I don't I really. Okay, you're good. Not good, really good. that <laughs> interested in um, whether Shelley was trying to justify um, his affairs, or even if he had any affairs at all. I mean, I don't think it adds much to the to our understanding of the poem at all. Thank you, Valentine. Thank you. I, I thought I heard a hey. Thank you. No, no, just, but do we think there's no sense, you, there are bits that, mm. well, two things, but I think there's also a kind of quest for self-determining what your value code is um, uh, in the poem, that I, I never was attached to the great that great sect whose doctrine is that each one should mm. select out of the crowd a mistress or a friend. It strikes me as that bit, um, Virgil's last speech um, to the, to the pilgrim saying, to Dante saying, you know, no more, no more advice now, <laughs> no more guidance. You know, you, you, you have the power to self-determine uh, and you need to decide that. So there's something quite Dantescan about that statement. Um, although it's deeply un-Dantescan in meaning, it, it, you know, that, I'm not saying that uh, Dante believes that, you know, in this kind of whatever we're going to call it, um, multiplicity of, of love but it does seem quite Dantescan in that but also there are parts of the poem that strike me as really quite um sensual and they might be song of songs sensual as as lots of um as have seen them as but they they are also quite um erotic and mary thought they were erotic. I, I agree i agree with you and they and they seem not only i mean at least to me there are some passages of the poem that seem um erotic and carnal and very physical and so inevitably bring you back to that um, biographical level so it's at some point as you read through the poem it seems difficult you know to to go beyond that literal literal plane that literal level uh, and and you know try to square those passages with uh, an allegorical or rhetorical interpretation of the poem uh, I think that, I mean, to me, that's um, to return to, to Bish's final question at the end of our uh, conversation before. To me, that's uh, something of a nature of the poem, you know, it's something, it's, you know, at times it's extremely exalted. And, and then there are passages which you really struggle to interpret in uh, uh, other than a physical description, you know, of an erotic encounter. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, I, 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 I've been educated on polyamory, so this is all very good. The next one is from Eric Lindstrom. In On Love, Shelley allows both fear and love on equal and related terms into the structure of desire. Feeling beyond ourself. Do you see any of that complex or dialectical relation to fear in a Pipsicudion? As to all of you, I mean, it's interesting that we started off with weakness, isn't it? That, that, I mean, that's a fear in and of itself. Michael, I saw you ready yeah, to. Um, I was, it's a kind of a bleak answer to that question, but I, but I was just thinking um, about something we haven't talked about yet it's so far in this discussion, which is he. He tells Olya, doesn't he, that he he actually doesn't want very many um, poems printed. He doesn't want very many uh, copies printed of this this poem. Um, specifies a, a run of not more than a hundred, or even just tells Olya to distribute it privately. And then, after Shelley's death, Olya tells Mary that he, he, he had been instructed by Shelley to suppress the poem. And, and so uh, I'm thinking about, I suppose, an, 
an awareness, poss possibly an ambiguity on Shelley's part about what it means to actually publish this work and that part of the, um, the, the thought process he goes through in relation to publication is one that includes fear of not being understood, fear of it being misinterpreted. That does seem to colour so much of what he, he writes about the poem. And I think you could say it's there in, in the poem itself. And, and one other thing which I think is there in the advertisement as well, and, and one can see it, perhaps the advertisement of Epicycidian alongside, um, you know, the, the preface to Alastor or other, you know, thinking about the, um, the preface to Julian Madelow, that there seems to be this acute self-awareness, thinking of Michael O'Neill's um, brilliant work on, on Shelley's self-consciousness, but he seems his, his kind of doubt and his acute sensitivity to the fact that this is probably not going to be understood by, by anybody seems to, seems to be um, presented in the advertisement as a, as a kind of um, safety mechanism, almost a, a kind of way of showing his his best readers, I suppose, that that he knows um, this is liable to be misunderstood. Sorry, that's a not not a very good answer to that question, Bish. I'm sorry. Great answer to that question. <laughs> I'm apologizing. I yeah, that was brilliant. I think I saw two, Stuart and Will, both have something to say about okay, that. Okay, well, uh, very quickly, I think that uh, Michael's use of the word doubt is is where the dialectic is. Um, uh, uh, and then it, it comes back to weak verses at the same time. Uh, but uh, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, uh, he knows what he wants to talk about, but he's not sure of the means to do it. And and then, um, uh, uh, so there's self-doubt in that sense, but there's also the doubt whether anybody is going to understand this, um, uh, uh, even if he could express it well. Um, so that the, uh, and, and then all through the poem, uh, a, a doubt of his own ability to commit, so to speak, to his ideal, uh, which is where the, the, as it were, biographical history uh, comes in. Uh, because, for instance, uh, the, the, whoever the cold chased moon is, is a maternal protective figure um, who, uh, who, who, who brings him back from the edge of the grave. Um, and uh, uh, so there's this, this sense of uh, uh, there is that capacity in, in him to lose it um, um, uh, as well. Uh, so I, I would see that that dialectic is everywhere in the poem. Um. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, anybody want to build on that or we'll move on to the next one? All good? Okay, so this is... Blah, 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 blah. This is also a love poem about pleasure. It's from Argyros. This is also a love poem about pleasure, even about fainting from excessive pleasure, obviously. How the poet himself can get that pleasure exactly from the specific poet poem. So I think there's a question here about the the idea about pleasure as a concept in the poem, um, and I think that's a very divided idea. I was wondering what you what you think of that idea within Epipsychodion. I mean, it actually links back to Matalinda as well, and the kind of the, the politics of pleasure, etc. It's a it's a big question. It becomes a bit Jane poemish at times. Uh, uh, the pleasure here. There's the stuff about moths being brought towards flames. Always be suspicious when Shelley talks about moths. You know, there's this. There's something about um, uh, knowing that something is forbidden um, at the centre of it. Whether you think it's forbidden or not. There are others that think it's forbidden, and I think that really gets into what Malinda was, what Valentina was saying about um, the, the Guido sonnet, um, because in, in in that sonnet, you know, it's this Shelley translated as, as strict community, strict meaning close, but 
strict also has other meanings that if you you know creating like minds where this kind of pleasure is is tolerated um uh or, or this kind of discussion of pleasure even is tolerated is is really important uh to the poem uh, kind of creating a community um and finding one person who believes in that community that kind of procession through various figures um in the earlier part of the poem seems to suggest that you need to find somebody or something whether that be pisa you know our, our, our roots were never struck so deep as a pisa and the, the transparent tree flourishes not and all that kind of thing this idea of kind of finding something where discussions of pleasure and the types of pleasure that you want to have are permissible anyone else want to jump in on that you know, I, um, uh, there's a way <clears throat> in which uh, this poem has um, a kind of very witty um, substructure to it. Uh, it is, after all, a poem of seduction. Um, and Shelley has to be aware of that. And, and though um, uh, you know, all the footnotes to the Vita Nuova, um, uh, uh, there ought to be one to Marlowe, um, uh, either Hero and Leander or... Um, um, uh, come with me and be my love and we will all the pleasures prove and uh, um, uh, the uh, <clears throat> um, I don't believe outside of Marlowe I mean Hero and Leander is uh, plays with uh, with sexual explicitness but I don't believe there is such an, a, an explicit poem in the English language before this um, uh, and uh, <clears throat> And the description or the enactment of a sexual climax in the poem um, is uh, uh, um, is is a wonder, because it, because it, it is very carefully written, but it is also um, um, uh, it, uh, it rises with a kind of rapture that is uh, simply astonishing. Um, so I don't know what more to say about it than that. I mean, it is a poem that ends in. Um, in, in extreme pleasure. Well, uh, and, I, I was going to add, Stuart, was just simply that, you know, um, Allen Ginsberg said it was the greatest orgasm in literature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, um, whilst no poet himself, at least, you know, he, he could have recognised poetry elsewhere. Um, OK, final two questions. We have one from Neil Freistad. How are we to read Shelley, the beginning uh, at the beginning of the poem, her own Shelley's sorry at the beginning of the poem, her own words in terms of love, polyamory from a different gender position than his own, her own words. That's an excellent question because it's so much about the kind of she's going to be the subject, mm. um, and she is the addressee. Uh, Although I quite like that thing that Stuart said about how late she comes into the, <laughs> uh, you know, that it's kind of important that she she's addressed late on. Um, strange. It's a very good question. <laughs> Anyone want to jump in unprepared? <laughs> on so far um please nora take it away uh, well it's not directly addressing this but it it's also harking back to the discussion about um uh, what valentina was talking about uh where the name amelia comes from and she is uh, so there um shelley uh translates that part of chaucer in which he is called the lily on the stalker Grena, and he translates that into Italian. And um, she, Emilia herself writes a poem on a lily, which I know you have, have edited in Valentina. And is she, is she there implicitly? Is there an implicit... Um, tribute to her poem. She's there as Emilia. She's there as the lily. She's there as somebody who is a poet. 
to um, at the beginning of, of the poem? Uh, is this a subtext of the poem, I, I wonder? Might it also not just be for an English audience, Amelia V, now imprisoned in the convent of, there's something about, I don't know, um, ba bad prefaces to Gothic novels, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but all good prefaces to Gothic novels too, you know, a preface to Otranto or something like that, that, that you, you, um, you, you appear to um, nod to the factual nature of the person addressed by quoting their own words, you know, a, a bit like, in a trance where you say i found the manuscript that says this but actually what you're doing is subjecting them to more fiction and subjecting them to more kind of um subterfuge yeah i mean in a sense he's using her words we don't even know if we, if, if she approved of that if he had asked her permission to use her own words because we know really nothing about those words and i mean the our only authority on the text where they are drawn is Medwin, and I mean, Medwin is not really the most reliable authority, especially when it comes to quoting, um, you know, original material belonging to someone else. Um, so yeah, there is, I, I totally agree with what Will just said. I mean, he's um, in uh, the parasexual elements of the poem, especially in the subtitle, Shelley sort of, um, nodding to the Gothic tradition and presenting uh, the addressee of the poem as uh, something of a Gothic heroine. And he does that in his letters as well. So, I mean, um, he, he genuinely believed, I think, at least at first, that she was a victim, a poor prisoner. And um, one thing to say is that Mary Shelley had the same idea at the beginning. She also uh, sympathized deeply with, with Teresa Viviani's uh, supposed suffering. Um, but it's, it's interesting what, what you uh, raised, Nora, about this um, presence of the dedicate as a fellow poet, in a sense. We know that Shelley held uh, Teresa Viviani in, um, and Teresa Viviani's talents in high regard, he, so he and Mary, as well as uh, Claire, Claire Mont, presumably thought that she was something of a poetic genius. Um, then at some point, I think Mary before the others realized that she was not that talented. But um, there's a degree in which Shelley is also playing on this. Uh, you know, he's writing this poem um, and he's saying that you will be able to understand the true meaning of the poem. And he's sort of implying that the person to whom the poem is addressed, uh, whoever she is, because the, the, the readers want to know, uh, in a sense, is one of, of the, the few of the selected few who will be able to understand the poem in its true meaning. Wonderful. Thank you, Valentina. I, I'm going to do something that UK audiences will be familiar with. I'm going to play David Dimbleby or Fiona Bruce now and ask a very brief question so I'm going to ask you to confine it very briefly so I don't take up any more of your time uh, this is a great question for Miralees Roberts and if we could get like a I don't know couple of sentences of your wisdom on this I'd be most grateful so the question is how do people think Shelley's examination of his own infatuation with idealized and in idealizing love differ in his short lyric poems from the way this is treated in the Pipsacudion. Let's start with you, Stuart. Oh boy. <clears throat> well, uh, in, uh, in thinking, I guess of the poems to, to, to Jane, uh, Invitation and Recollection, uh, what I've always thought was extraordinary about that is that um, that the center isn't there. Um, that is to say, uh, the experience is surrounded by thinking about what it's going to be like and then thinking about what it was like, but the experience isn't there. Um, and there's something curiously akin to that here. Um, um, there's this striving constantly to... To, to connect um, the right words to, to, the, uh, uh, to the thing itself or the, 
the being herself and um, and and a continual inability to do so. So the, I I, um, I think that the, uh, the the last word of the poem proper, though it could be seen as Elizabethan, I expire. Um, uh, in, uh, in, in, in a sexual connotation is also, uh, I, I finally simply fail. Um, it, it, uh, this entire poem has been proleptic and it is just, that's what it's been. Um, um, I'll never finish, I'll never get to the end. Um, so uh, I, um, there, uh, at, at any rate, I mean, there are a lot of shorter poems that, uh, 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 that uh, our attempt, as in to Costantia, uh, uh, to uh, to to describe ecstasy, and uh, and all you can do is to say it's there. Thank you, Stuart. Beautiful, pithy, gorgeous. Will, um, I, I guess it's it's very hard to write a sustained uh, lyric, allegory, metaphor over the amount of lines that Pisikidian is. Um, uh, it's the bit that, 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 that readers have often thought is the beginning of the biographical passage. In many mortal forms, I rashly sought the shadow of that idol of my thought. But that's kind of what the poem is, right? It's many forms to try and find uh, this way of saying it. Whereas in the shorter poems, they often have a, a hook or a conceit or a, thinking of the magnetic lady being magnetism being the conceit or um, Ariel Miranda being the conceit in some of the Jane poems or uh, the fisherman's in his lamp, that, 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 that you can sustain that over 30, 40, 50 lines quite easily. But the, the, what's kind of amazing about Episcidian, and, and I wouldn't say good or bad about it, but amazing about it, <laughs> is that it kind of regenerates different ways and different metaphors and different analogies to do what it does. And that's why it's kind of, it differs from those lyrics, but purely on a kind of conceptual level, that it has to reinvent and recreate and find forms. Wonderful. Thank you, Will. And Michael? Yes. Not sure I can add much to what Stuart would have said, except perhaps that develop something of what they said around the the layers. I guess I mean just that we we talked about this the the envoy at the end, the advertisement, the um, there, there's a kind of more elaborate superstructure somehow around this poem, and I think that thinking. Sorry to come back to Dante, but but I do keep thinking of that way in which the poem seems so open to philosophy. In it, perhaps not quite the same with 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 the lyrics we've been talking about. Thank you, Michael. And finally, Valentina. Um, my answer would also be like Michael's, um, the Dantean superstructure. But perhaps we can also compare this poem to uh, an earlier attempt, uh, which is Alasso, uh, especially the, the narrative part of Epipsychidion is sort of a rewriting of a more mature rewriting of the quest for ideal love that Shelley first presented in Alasso. So maybe we should look back instead of looking forward. I don't know. I like that, Valentina. I always think that the poet of Alaska would have written a Pipsicurion. So absolutely glorious. I, I would just like to take this time to thank our wonderful panel, uh, Stuart Curran, Will Bowers, uh, Michael Rossington, Valentina Vanelli. Incredible. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation about a, a supreme poem. And I do hope that I will see some of you at the Shelley Conference in 2022 at Keats House, Hampstead. Follow Twitter, see us on our, our website. I know the details have been put in. Um, it's been a real delight. Thank you very much. And uh, as we say in this part of the world, no star, have a lovely evening and um, see you again soon. Thank you. Can I just um, get everyone to thank Bish for wonderful chairing and fielding all those questions and for great questions too. Well done, Bish. <laughs>